And now, a special edition of Hear My Voice. A lot of people on campus are battling things that they don't speak about because they feel uncomfortable, they may feel brushed off, they just may feel unrelatable. State of the nation, state of the student. Get out of our comfort zone and communicate with different people, not just stick to who we know. Is there really justice for all? And I think that it's really important to tell people that it's okay to not be okay. Live from Gregory Hall, your 90-minute special starts now. Welcome to this evening's production of uh, Hear My Voice and UI7 News, State of the Nation, State of the Student, Is There Justice for All? My name is Ori Benatar. And my name is Isabella Perez. We have an intriguing 90 minutes coming up for our audience here in Gregory Hall and the audience watching at home online and on TV on UI7. And over the next half an hour, we're going to be investigating some of the most pressing issues facing the average college student. Today, we'll also have a chance for people to speak and be heard throughout the entire broadcast. So settle in as we look to hear your voice and answer the questions of whether there can be justice for all. What are you feeling, Ori? I'm excited. I think it should be a, an interesting show. We've got a lot of broad topics we're going to be going over, you know, education, religion, emotional well-being, freedom of speech, just a lot of stuff that is very present with the college student today, and I think we're going to get a lot of good insight about everything. Yeah, we're, we'll, we will be talking about really complex topics, so hopefully we'll get a really, like, a nice detail about everything. So, and we encourage the audience here to talk and be free to ask any questions throughout the show. Uh, so yes. And make sure if you're on UI7 News on YouTube yes. or Facebook at Hear My Voice Online, use the hashtag Hear My Voice on Twitter to stay in the conversation socially. But what better way to start this evening's show than with an opening question? Uh, we're going to start by seeing what college students think the state of the student is. They're kind of like to themselves. They don't really try to intertwine into other cultures, and it may be for a lot of reasons. Maybe because they feel comfortable you know, and they feel more related to their culture. Also, you know, it could be a bunch of things, but I would say some people may be um, afraid of learning about other cultures, but I think that's a problem. I think we should be able to diversify ourselves. Like, cause for example, I'm Muslim. Like, I shouldn't have to be going just like a MSA, like a Muslim Student Association, and like feel like I, I belong or like to be with, like that group of people. It should be something that's you know, more throughout the campus for like all religions and like just for everyone and like all races. Right. I think it all ties to what our nation is representing right now. And if we're not going to catch up as a whole, it's hard for the university to try to represent all these issues. And I guess if we're not doing this right now, that means that the nation as a whole is suffering when it comes to so we are, are going to open this conversation. We have a powerful and exclusive story regarding the most recent allegations actually toward U of I economics professor and a former mayoral candidate, Joe Petrie. He was placed on administrative leave this semester after students accused him of inappropriate conduct. And with more on the story, we are going to bring in our first special reporter of the broadcast, Will Most. Uh, Will, what do we need to know about the story right now? Hi, Ori. Uh, on April 11th, a post was posted on the UIUC subreddit titled Answered, Where is Petrie? Appeared, it, it appeared on the subreddit and it was authored by the user Schizo. She said, economics professor Joe Petrie's extended absence was caused by an investigation she initiated over his sexual misconduct. I had the opportunity to speak to the author of this post who is asked to remain anonymous and be referred to as Sunny. It is important to understand that this story is not only part of a bigger story, but in an important voice that should be heard. Sunny took Petrie's econ stats class in the fall of 2017. Her initial impression of him was positive. He seemed friendly and even brought his dog to lectures. One day after class, she visited him during office hours. During this meeting, she says they exchanged phone numbers. Soon after, she says, Petrie sent graphic images along with messages soliciting pictures back, sex in exchange for money, and for an A-plus in econ stats. Sending texts that said, stop contacting me, and like this is not something I want to receive from you, and him taking it as, like my words were kind of a game to him, and he didn't care what I was saying. Since her post on the university's Reddit website, Sunny says 15 other users have messaged her claiming similar experiences with Petrie. Two of the messengers have submitted evidence to the police, expanding the investigation, which Sunny began in the fall of 2018. 
while other messengers aren't a part of the investigation. Many of them are communicating with Sonny for support, asking the same question Sonny has been asking herself. What would make him like choose me, I guess, is something that I definitely thought. And it was, I don't want to say embarrassing, but just makes me think like why me university spokesperson robin kaler stated quote mr petrie is on administrative leave while we investigate accusations regarding his conduct however the safety and security of students is our top priority and we worked hard to ensure that petrie himself made a comment to the news gazette stating i can confirm that i have been on administrative leave during the pendency of a university investigation i have cooperated with the investigation to every extent required sunny however has not felt cooperation but rather hostility in the form of veiled threats and constant messaging from people she believes to be Petrie or his associates. She described repeated messages from Petrie's wife, who tried to guilt her out of coming forward. On Sunny's Reddit post, an account called Illini Fan JP commented, saying, delete this or there will be consequences within the next few hours. She says an hour later, the account posted her full name, which was quickly deleted by one of the site's moderators. Sunny believes that this account belongs to Petrie or a friend because the account's name is consistent with Petrie's Snapchat username. While the outcome of the investigation is unclear and Sunny has found dealing with her posts to be both scary and taxing, she doesn't have any regrets about how she's dealt with the situation. I'm glad this is like the path that I chose and I'm glad I went to the police and I'm glad Mr. Petrie isn't on campus right now. I'm glad that He's not being a predator to another girl right now. He's not being a predator to another girl right now. So thank you very much, Will, for telling us that story. But uh, did you actually try to talk to Petrie for this? I did. I reached out to him through email, and he did not respond. Of course, I had the News Gazette comment in there. That's, to my knowledge, the only communique he's had with uh, anyone outside of the university about this investigation. And as far as we know, he hasn't been convicted by a court of law. So what can be expected from now on? Um, well, the investigation was originally supposed to conclude uh, right around this time. But as I said, since two more people expanded the investigation, uh, I don't anticipate the investigation completing within this school year. And I'm not even positive that criminal charges will be brought against him. Uh, the charges that Sonny was most concerned with were just uh, internal university policy. And just looking at this along with other uh, teacher scandals that have happened across college campuses, why do you think it's such a common occurrence, but also, you know, how has it been handled throughout history as we've seen recently? Well, it's, it's an interesting situation. Uh, the university uh, says that they protect the student and that they're protecting uh, the school. And historically, uh, sometimes that's proven not to be the case. It's very important that they protect the institution. Uh, but right here, I think we're headed in the right direction direction, the fact that they're acknowledging that there's an investigation, the fact that there's been a quick turnaround, uh, or relatively quick turnaround, um, indicates that maybe we're seeing more accountability for students. Yeah, we have to acknowledge how brave Sonny was to come up forward and give us this amazing interview that you had. So thank you so much for that report, Will. No problem. Thank you. Yep. And uh, as a senior at this university, a lot has happened over the past four years here at the University of Illinois. Thank goodness and luckily, most of them have been joyful. Uh, there's a lot that I'm going to be remembering, but there's been a lot of tragedies that have happened on this campus. The one that I point out in particular, September of 2016, the Green Street shooting, of course, uh, one student passed away, five were hurt. It was actually a visitor who passed away that day. And then just a year later, two students dying within a month of each other. Uh, of course, that yeah. horrible suicide on top of Cranert and uh, the death in unofficial two years ago. Yeah, I have personally felt really safe in this campus, but we have to acknowledge what have happened throughout the years. And also in 2017, we have the grad student, Ying Ying, who went missing, and this is a still an ongoing trial that uh, we'll see how it turns out. Yeah, that was a big national story, yeah, too. Yeah, a national story. And this Saturday, we had like an attempted burglary in Daniels Hall, so got to be safe out there. And even last night with the uh, reports of the bricking yes. and mugging uh, from uh, gang members. Police did report that some of the incidents that were reported didn't happen, but that kind of put a put a jolt into a lot of the students, obviously. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And we'll touch more on events of this nature as we continue to talk about the state of the students on college campuses today. Yeah, a lot of thought-provoking ideas just to get started here. And uh, now we're going to actually turn it over to our audience hosts who are going to be looking at the live crowd throughout and we're going to take it now to Will Bro and Chanel Newsom who will be joining us throughout the evening talking to our crowd in Gregory Hall. Guys, what are they saying? Thanks, Lori. So today we have a student, Kayla Stephens, all the way from Peoria, Illinois. So tell me, Kayla, how do you feel about 
feel about the access of protection being available to students at the public university? So, you know, we have the resources in our state lives, we have the resources that are efficient to you. I think they have been really efficient to me. Um, I do think one issue is the um, sort of advertisement of these services, so not every student is aware of them, and if they are, I do feel like um, they are presented in a very like professional manner, and a lot of students don't feel like that humanity aspect to it, but I do think we do have a lot of good resources. Okay, so do you encourage students, like if you had a friend that wanted to come to you for advice, but you couldn't help her as much, how do you think the process is, like, attending, like, going to the counseling center? Is it a huge process to go through? Can you tell me more about that? Um, well, I have personally been through that process, and I do think it does need a little bit of readjustment. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. All right, well, we'll bring it back to you, Ori. All right. Thanks, Chanel. Uh, Thank you, Thank you. Excited to see the rest of the audience interaction throughout the evening. <laughs> a really good start to it. But we're actually going to be taking a quick break right now. When we come back, we will move on to the discussion of emotional well-being. We will see if students know where to go for emotional help. And we will bring on our first live guest to talk about mental health. We'll be right back. Welcome back to a special UI7 and here my best production of State of the Nation and State of the Students. So after hearing about how the students on this campus feel about their protection, the university and more, we're going to dive now into emotional well-being, something that affects really every college student with anxiety from class and stress from being away from home. It's just something that's become very prevalent now throughout yes. university students. And I think that it's really nice that we can talk about it so it's not taboo and everyone can know that there are re there's resources in campus that you can reach, experts that are there for us in every mo point in time that right. we need. And the question is, is do people know about those resources as we are going to be joined now by reporter Emily Steinmetz who took to campus to speak with one particular student to find out more about what resources are like on on campus in the case of an assault or when seeking emotional help. Emily, what can you tell us about that? Right, so I was able to talk to students about issues that they feel passionate about on campus and when I met Princess instantly, she spoke from the heart and had very powerful thoughts about the involvement of the Greek, the black community with the um, counseling center on campus. So within the black community, we always have topics of discussing mental health, but not going in depth. So what that I mean is, yeah, we can say like we're sad, but we don't go further with finding effective solutions to that problem. And I think that's extremely important because like I said, a lot of people on campus are battling things that they don't speak about because they feel uncomfortable. They may feel brushed off. They just may feel unrelatable. And what Princess explained didn't just come from observation, it came from her personal experience, which is what I found very powerful. Community, I actually did go to the counseling center and I spoke with someone and I just didn't feel that type of connection and I felt that other students on campus probably feel that way that when they finally decided to actually break the barrier in the black community and speak out about the things that they're needing help with, they didn't actually receive the help that they, they wanted to. And Princess shared with me that there are black counselors at the counseling center on campus, but it might not necessarily be a thing that's advertised to those that might utilize those services the most. Black community, we often feel shunned and ashamed for feeling these different experiences, and I think that it's really important to give them a space where they can feel comfortable discussing these issues, because a lot of this stuff is rooted from the way that we were raised. Um, so Emily, how do you think we can link all of these to emotional well-being? Right, so really what she, uh, Princess, in the end of our conversation, she said, really what people need to know is it's okay to not be okay. And I think a lot of people hear that, but it's really internalizing that and making it personal to yourself and realizing everyone does have those issues that we go through and there are plenty of professionals on campus to seek and it's just finding the way that works for you. And so she kind of had an experience the opposite, but then also found a solution for herself. Um, so that's kind of what I think other people on campus could do is yes. try something, you know, and that's the first step and then just see what happens from there. Thank you so much, Emily. Really ex exciting reporting. Uh, for more on this discussion of emotional well-being, let's welcome special reporter Errol Majeski. How are you, Ariel? I'm good. How are you, Isabella? I'm great. Thank you. <laughs> well, 
Overwhelming anxiety and depression are no strangers to college students, but counseling may be as demand grows beyond what the amount can be offered through student funds at the university. Let's take a look. 50,000 students that walk on this campus. There's pressure on the university's mental health services to address everyone's needs. And as for crisis situations, there are six members within the university's suicide prevention team who review a large amount of suicide incident reports per year. One member, Tom Meebach, says the pressure and need of their services is obvious. I think it's safe to say we, we could use more counselors, absolutely. As the student body itself continues to grow, and I know that nationally, College counseling centers are seeing an increased demand for services in general, uh, as well as crisis services. So, so yeah, I think that the demand we're seeing would warrant more staff for sure. When it comes to the counseling center, there are 31 clinical staff members with four supervised interns. McKinley uses their primary care physicians and nurse practitioners to address specific counseling needs to not overburden their eight member staff of psychiatrists, psychologists, and clinical social workers. At DRES, otherwise known as Disability Resources and Educational Services, there are three listed psychologists on their directory. And at the Women's Resources Center, only two staff members are trained to provide confidential advising. That's a small number. And so is the fact that in 2018, the center's prevention programs reached less than one-fourth of all students. Jane Snyder worked for three semesters as a paraprofessional for the Counseling Center. She says the lack of longer-term counseling is not just due to staffing numbers. The problem is due to the numbers that deal with funding. It's just not enough, and the students are the one who suffer. It's a give and take of that. It's good that we're able to see lots of students and be able to get um, students help that they need, but at the same time, it's when you build that relationship with a therapist and then have to break it you know, semester later, that can be very um, hard on someone. Funding for the Counseling Center comes solely through student health fees. While a student referendum to increase funding is in the works, the Counseling Center has already started to distribute more clinicians within colleges, known as embedding. Two counselors are embedded in two colleges as of last year, and they are working on hiring two more. While there are still developing efforts to increase accessibility and outreach opportunities for these students, there's still the challenge of finding the right counselor for them and building that connection. One example is Hermione Wan, a junior in biochemistry. She sought counseling to help her cope with interpersonal relationships. For Wan, she felt McKinley gave a more personal approach to her concerns versus the counseling center. I think they have this coping mechanism of like a certain genre of problems and They'll send you out emails and they'll, uh, they'll recommend you to read some of their materials and, and they will recommend that you join a group therapy. So it's not necessarily like uh, tailored to your own like life or stories. But there are other students who gravitated towards the materials and options of group therapy, like that of graduate student Caitlin Brooks, who posted her positive experience publicly. It goes to show that finding help and solutions in this field can be a developing process. Great reporting, Ariel, but the story doesn't end here. What is still happening here uh, on campus? Well, Isabella, students' voices are considered primary sources of feedback and input for services like the Counseling Center. This particular center and the Student Advisory Committee meet monthly for improving uh, possible considerations from that. Um, and paraprofessionals like student undergraduate, she is um, uh, the one source we had here, Shane Snyder. Uh, she also brings awareness by giving course trainings um, and just trying to show how, what are the warning signs for students uh, and how to be a supportive person, not overstepping that boundary. Snyder was also telling me how she's working on multiple projects such as getting professors to include mental health statements in their syllabi so students know, uh, you know the resources from day one. And then another thing she was mentioning is another possible suicide prevention technique is having Illini alerts notify students when there's a suicide on campus. That way, when something happens, there's this instigation where you can start talking about these things um, because it's a very difficult subject. Um, and then as part of the mental health student government, Shanae Snyder helps uh, with nine other members and she works with emerging mental health RSOs on campus to just create an overall bigger community and uh, reach out to as many students as possible. And as other than that, uh, in, in order to keep the mental health awareness in conversation, uh, the McKinley Health Center is also uh, looking over data and results 
through past surveys in order to develop more programs. Really interesting. All right, well, uh, we're actually going to be continuing this conversation. We're going to turn it to two representatives from the Counseling Center. We welcome now Dr. Deidre Weathersby and licensed welcome. clinical social worker Alejandro Gomez. So, feel free to join us here. Please. <laughs> How are you doing, guys? I'm oh, good, thank you. Let's give me a mic. Yes. Don't worry, I'm in the club with you there, too. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, thank welcome. You. How are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Oh, good, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Sure. Thank you for having us. So what do you guys kind of see as sort of the main setbacks in reaching the needs of students uh, in the university? You want to start? And I, okay, sure. <laughs> I will. So we'll tag team. So reaching all students, obviously it's a numbers game. That's the obvious. With over 50,000 students, we have 31 counselors, right? So um, we have many different ways to access uh, for students to access our services. Clinical services is one of them, individual services. We also have prevention services. I know Alejandro co-chairs our suicide incident uh, reporting program, and so that's another way. We also have psychoeducation courses. I know that it was mentioned earlier about our group psychotherapy options. And so I think we have to continue to be creative on how we reach students. We even, um, post some YouTube videos <laughs> on our channel That's at the Counseling nice. Center, giving That's quick really nice. tips during this time. And um, yeah, I don't know we, if you have Yeah, because we're that. a firm believer in outreach and prevention and, and just getting a lot of that psychoeducational piece out mm -hmm. there to the students and being out there. So uh, truth be told, a lot of counseling centers traditionally just focus on uh, individual therapy and um, group counseling, so that traditional model, whereas we're very focused in terms of the trifold effect as mm -hmm. far as the clinical services, outreach and prevention, and then we also offer training services. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the CCP program, we offer uh, training service for doctoral students and then practicum students as well. Really interesting guys, thank you so much. And do we know why there's been like a, a rise in the numbers of suicides? Is there a reason? Have, have you know something about it? Mm -hmm. Well, during that program, uh, historically, the number of referrals has increased. So the number of suicides and the number of suicide referrals that have been activated that deemed uh, warranted activation has an increase. That, ha ha that has been consistent and constant throughout the past 10 years. And so I've been uh, part of this program and sharing it for the past about seven years now. Um, historically, it's been a one-person uh, intervention program yeah. historically with Dr. Paul Jaffe back in about 1984. <laughs> uh, so it's a program that was initiated and auspiced through the Office of the Dean of Students. And so now we have, in addition to uh, five counseling center uh, professionals involved in the program, we also have a representative from McKinley Health Center. Uh, on the team. And that's helpful, I imagine. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's it's like uh, Dr. Weathersby was saying, it's a numbers game. So I think with the outreach and prevention, a, a lot of that stigma is being demystified in a sense. Mm -hmm. So people feel more compelled and more confident in reaching out and submitting an information and referrals. So I think that, you know, that speaks to that piece. Um, I think also the fact that we're going back and seeing this, this graph as far as the number of referrals mm -hmm. has increased. We also asked to, to um, uh, admit that the uh, we've gone from about 38,000 students mm -hmm. total in, total enrollment in terms of undergraduate and graduate, you know, from 2004 to to now, mm -hmm. which it's increased about yeah. uh, about 10,000 stu more students. Mm -hmm. So, right, more students, you're going to have more incidents. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's correct. And have you guys seen sort of the numbers grow with how m much people seek counseling help and? How kind of often do you uh, feel that uh, people will seek services anonymously or they prefer to have one-on-one -on -one with a group? What, what have you guys seen sort of as the years have gone by? Well, initially, I think that students often, when they come in, want that one-on-one -on -one attention. Mm -hmm. And we do our best to uh, give them that access. Um, but I would like to say something about group psychotherapy. I think once students hear that, they um, may immediately shut down to the idea. And so we'll spend some time in individual counseling, motivating, um, helping them understand the process. But it's a therapeutic process. And um, there are two clinicians typically in our group therapy. And it is a long-term option and a therapeutic healing option for students to have. And so it's not like maybe what students may see on TV, yeah. people going around talking about right, this work yeah. group. It's actually a therapy option. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a process-oriented group, and it's mm -hmm. a conversation where it's it's something that we engage with the student. And every student's needs is different, and so when we have that conversation of in, in terms of options and trying to encourage individuals to to seek that option, I think it's be, uh, being transparent of what that process might have looked like for certain individuals. Because I've seen lots of uh, students where I've had them in group uh, for several years. They can have that group mm -hmm. option for as long as you have your academic career here. So potentially getting yeah. connected to a group therapy. Um, uh, your freshman year and being able to utilize for three or four years is, you know, it's not something you would get there out there, you know, in the real world. Yeah, you know. it might be like a really nice experience for them. Yeah. Uh, as far as they start uh, getting comfortable with. The yeah, idea. definitely. And people are hesitant to be honest at, mm -hmm. at first, but once you 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 talk about the process, because I've had so many group members that are like kicking and screaming that they don't want to leave. Really? By, by, sure. the, by the end of wow, it, so absolutely. Yeah. And I would like to know your comment on uh, what the students are proposing about maybe having a Lalaina alert for suicide prevention. What do you think about this? Well, certainly as a psychologist and a clinician on staff, um, our job is to really take care of the individual and the community. And so when a trauma happens or a death by suicide, we're out there. Um, doing activating what we call a trauma response and we're connecting with that students classrooms student groups families whatever we can do to help the grieving process in the community heal um, whether or not alerts should happen is probably a better question for where the alerts come from and that's usually a collaboration between like Dean of Students and campus um, safety and police um, they make decisions about those alerts. And working specifically uh, in that area and sharing the uh, suicide intervention team, um, my immediate concerns are, you know, uh, what all factors are t being taken into consideration in terms of, you know, how much extent or how much information, if this was proposed, you know, that mm -hmm. the students would mm -hmm. want in terms of right. details, where, it, yeah. which, you know, as a which clinician, might be dangerous because it, it, a suicide yeah. contagion, yes. yeah, exactly. exactly, and how the research shows that that might lead to further suicide or mm -hmm. suicidal behavior. Mm -hmm. so Things of that sort, privacy of the student and the family in addition to that. So those are the immediate questions because uh, first and foremost, we're going to be centered in terms of safety, you know, safety first and, you know, responding to the student's needs. And I guess one last question uh, before we move on. What would be something you would tell a student who has stress or anxiety but is not ready to take that step to seek professional help? What would be something you would say to a student like that? We always say take that first best step wherever you are comfortable. We have so many resources on campus, whether it's in campus housing, res life, a cultural house, um, uh, an academic advisor or mentor. We typically keep connections with all of those uh, constituents and, and folks on campus. And so getting the help you need will eventually come in and we're out there where they are. We reach over 32,000 students in our prevention programming. And so we are often tabling or connecting with students. The last thing I'll say is we do have clinicians of color. Uh, our pictures are up on our staff website and we have many options for particular ethnic groups or other affinity groups and so we hope that every student no matter what they identify as would feel comfortable. Yeah and counseling and uh, services in other languages as well yes. uh, and I think it's it's you know to that question I think it's a it's a personal and also a, cult, a cultural mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, fact, factor. You know, and so with the, the fact that Dr. Weathersby was saying that we actually get out there, we're not simply in the office all, all day, we go out there and do outreach, outreach and prevention. So, you know, being part of the, the cultural houses, like I chair the Latino, Latina, and Latinx outreach and prevention on campus. So I do liaison uh, ship work with La Casa Cultura Latina. So I, I constantly have a weekly office hour over there. I'm constantly do, uh, doing outreach and prevention and psychoeducation uh, programs out there. And so it's, it's you know, it's the process is being out there and engaged with the students and again demystifying that you know that, that. what amazing work you do thank you so much thank you guys thank for coming you. onto you. the show thank you so we're going to take it out now to the uh, audience will who you got for us Alrighty, so i grabbed one of our audience members this is isaac trotter who's actually from the champaign area isaac uh based on what you've seen so far could you just tell me how do you feel the school is handling emotional wellness as a 
as an overall problem? Yeah, I think it's been pretty good for the most part. You can do things in a lot of different ways. I know personally for me, I haven't had to go to the counseling center. I kind of consider myself kind of lucky. But I also do know that I have professors, especially in journalism, which I'm in, that are very open to talking about that stuff with me. I know that my advisor's been great about that. Sometimes I'm a workaholic, and they're very much on like the, maybe you should take one or two things off your plate a little bit and slow down. So like you're, you're fine. And so I, I think there are a lot of options for us, and that's really appreciative. And it's not just at the counseling center you can also go to a lot of different places and they do genuinely care about you cool and are there any changes that you'd like to see in terms of how the school goes about uh, things like this no I think I think for the most part we're pretty good I think sometimes there have been pretty nasty incidences around campus that are definitely concerning and sometimes if we have more open forums where we can talk about some of those things that can happen or even one-on-one -on -one forums to talk about like especially after the kidnapping that happened a couple years ago I know that that really tra like traumatized a lot of people and then the instance last night with the mugging, like that could really um, affect some people too. So if you're able to go talk to somebody about that, maybe in a more of an open forum where you talk about maybe your concerns, that would be something I'd probably add. That's great. Thank you, Isaac. And uh, we'll head back over to Ori on uh, News Desk. All right. Thanks a lot, Will. Thank you so much. And thank you for the audience intervening. Um, so if you ever feel in distress or you just feel the need to talk to someone, there's a lot of resources that you can use. Um, and feel free because these people are experts and are open to talk to everyone. If you are in the United States, you can text CONNECT to the number we have in the screen and you can also call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. We also have that number there. And for a more local number, you can reach the Mental Health Center of Champaign County. There's a crisis line there that you might want to check out. So, Ori, any thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of good resources that people can get out to. I know sometimes that first step to uh, yes. seeking out the resource is tough, but they're there to help their professional. And, and it's not easy. It and also, if you know someone who is going through a tough time, of you course. can also call and maybe seek for some advice in this in this topic, which is not easy. So right. at least there's resources for everyone out there. Right. Well, coming up, we're going to jump to the First Amendment and talk about the freedom of speech and of the press. We will welcome U of I student Madeline Hubbard, who will share her experiences with speech and her response to the issues facing us today. We'll be back. Stay with us. The former chief editor of the Daily Illini says that this freedom is crucial for a democracy to work properly. She also says that one important aspect of our freedom of speech Welcome back to a special presentation of UI7 News and hear my voice, State of the Nation, State of the Student. I am Ori Benatar. And I am Isabella Perez. Glad you're joining us here at Gregory Hall on YouTube or on TV. We are going to move away from the emotional health of students on campus to a pillar of the United States, the Constitution. As journalism students, we must learn the ins and outs of the nearly 250-year-old document, which gives us the freedom to express, of course, that being the First Amendment. The concept of freedom of speech has been dissected and analyzed thousands of times and now more than ever is affecting journalists and uh, students in college campuses across the United States. And for more on that, we're, we've got Will Bro up from the audience, our special reporter um, who's going to be talking to us about this. And Will, Thank you for how, joining us. how can we fight for this freedom in our country and at universities today? Well, Ori, uh, a freedom that many citizens of the United States take for granted is our freedom of speech as well as uh, freedom of expression. The First Amendment of our Constitution prevents the government from cheating or creating laws that restrict our right uh, to speak freely. The former chief editor of the Daily Illini says that this freedom is crucial for a democracy to work properly. She also says that one important aspect of our freedom of speech is our right to access of government information through a Freedom of Information Act request. With FOIA requests and stuff like that, you have to be very specific in the information that you're um, asking for, which is why it can be really tricky. And they, um, I guess the people behind those organizations will find any way to kind of turn it down because they don't necessarily want to give you um, just all of that information. She says that the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA requests, are very important when it comes to being able to express concerns and how the government is governing its own citizens. Back in March, President of the United States Donald Trump announced plans to not allow federal funding to go to universities if they do not fully support freedom of speech on their campuses. This was in response to some critics who claimed that the institutions of higher education were targeting right-wing viewpoints. 
Brian Dolliner is a local community journalist who writes for the newspaper The Public Eye and covers topics like mass incarceration and immigration. He says that Trump's announcement was to leverage political voices for his benefit. I mean, there's been professors here at the University of Illinois who have been run out of town because of their support of Palestine, I'm talking here specifically of Stephen Salida. Um, so there is already a kind of uh, threat to, to free speech and, and, and free education, popular education, that takes place in many forms. Uh, and Trump's articulation is just one of the most recent. Scott Fleming is a U of I senior studying political science, and he also believes that the president's announcement did not have anything to do with protecting the people's First Amendment right. That in this case, the, the usage of the First Amendment here is, is being used as a political weapon as more of a, uh, as a, uh, like a, something to, to uh, get his base riled up politically um, about the perceived issue that, I think the perceived issue here being that uh, conservative voices are being uh, s stopped or, or silenced somehow on college campuses, and I don't think that's really an issue. In Urbana, this is Will Bro with the State of the Nation and the State of the School. So, Will, any final thoughts after your package? It was amazing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Many people don't really think about the Constitution in general, as well as a lot of our freedoms that, we, that it gives us. And m many people don't ever really think about our First Amendment right when it comes to freedom of religion, press, speech and expression. People don't really think about that. And then things come up from time to time, like especially with Trump and uh, announcing that he's going to strip funding to national s schools. It's just weird to think that, that like, First Amendment rights and First Amendment topics come up all the time when you don't really think about it and don't really notice it. Yeah, it was really interesting what the senior was saying about using this as a, as a weapon, you know, for propaganda. Yeah, it was yeah. basically using it as a way for him to help leverage his own beliefs and thoughts and certain right-wing viewpoints as well and certain right-wing groups. Definitely. Well, thanks a lot, Will. We'll see you back in the audience throughout yeah. the broadcast. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're now going to talk about uh, Juliana Stratton, who is the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, who stopped by Noise, La Noise Laboratory this morning to speak with journalism students about her time at UI, uh, U of I, her career in public service, and the importance of the press. The event after Stratton arrived late, so this didn't leave much time for a Q&A after their remarks. But she did talk about her time as a journalist student here at the U of I and later discussed criminal justice reform and the importance of the press. Despite President Trump's comments that the press is the enemy of the people, Stratton stressed the importance of facts. There has been sort of this, you know, especially with the rise of social media, um, this ability to kind of take something and decide that I only want to hear one perspective and so I'm going to focus on my truth over here and others will focus on their truth on this side um, without us really grappling with what the real facts are. I, I was looking for he always says, come on, we gotta go. The importance of journalists in delivering those facts to the public and lifting up the voices of people who aren't often heard. We now bring you of I junior, Madeline Hubbard. How are you today? Good, thank you so much for having me on the show. So you're the campus coordinator for Turning Point USA. So how's your experience uh, with this? What, what do you do in this organization? I'm campus coordinator and president of the organization. I was secretary last year. And the goal of our organization is to promote free speech, Second Amendment rights, and capitalism. And uh, obviously, you're, you're a junior here at U of I. And I feel, and you've had sort of a journey when it comes to like your major. You want to try and talk about that a little <laughs> yeah. bit? So I began as a journalism major, 2016 election, and I wanted to be unbiased, show as little bias as possible, and I just became increasingly frustrated as more and more people were just spreading false information. I felt like the newsroom really didn't have that much diversity of thought, and I wanted to make an impact, and that's why eventually I just heard so much misinformation and I couldn't be silent and so I decided to join Turning Point and now I'm a pre-law student as well as a journalism student. Mm -hmm. ah, so you are still in journalism as well? Yes. That's great. So I have to take a tangent here. What happened? Are you okay with your arm? I'm yeah. <laughs> well I was in Washington DC day before I was supposed to go to the White House I fell off of an electric scooter. Oof. Ooh. Is it you're hurting right now? <laughs> I'll be all right. Was Thank it a scooter you. tour or you just decided, oh, I'll go on a scooter in D.C.? It's those scooters that you can rent and apparently oh. they're coming to campus and I'm kind of scared. Oh. <laughs> Without reason. Um, so now let's bring it back to our subject. Um, so we know that you have encountered really ni like not nice comments online uh, and you promote free speech. So how do you deal with these mean comments? 
So a lot of students get very upset whenever they hear these types of comments. That's why I say I'm okay with the hatred coming towards me. A long time ago, I learned to stop caring about what people thought about me. If they really knew me, they would know that I'm a good person who cares. And I just ignore the haters. It is their right to call me all these names, say all of these horrible things about me. And if they really care, then they would get to know me before saying those things. Have you always had a thick skin or is that something you've kind of developed over time? I had developed it in high school or so. Um, I've always been very vocal about my opinions, and whenever you want to enter the world of politics, you have to have a thick skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that we know that this is a problem, do you think there's a solution, a possible solution for this issue? For the issue of free speech? Yeah, for the issue of, of, of people that feel that they cannot speak because they're afraid, maybe. So I've had so many students come up to me on campus saying, oh my goodness, I can't believe that there are other students that think like me. Thank you so much for doing your work. And I think that if I could let more students like that know that they aren't alone and know that they can feel comfortable voicing their opinions, then it will kind of help solve the current you know, situation that we are in in many universities. Now, you're speaking, do you feel that you're sort of a spokesperson for maybe the minority opinion in this regard? And what's kind of the inspiration behind that? What's your motivation to do this? So Turning Point USA promotes the opinions that half of Americans have. Mm -hmm. They are mainstream conservative opinions. And I think that a lot of students on campus just feel like the minority when in reality they aren't. Whenever you actually talk to students, most students agree with the First Amendment. They agree with at least the principles of capitalism. And having this organization lets students know that they aren't alone and that I at least want to be able to get education out there. And I think that if we can educate people as to what the First Amendment is, then we can be a step closer to solving the problem. So what would you say is the final goal that you have working with this organization? That's a big question. I think that I would like to be able to say that get more members, get more students to realize what their First Amendment rights are and be able to feel free to act on those. I don't think any student should be afraid of, say, voicing their opinion in class because they don't want a lower grade from a professor. Yes. And uh, I think one other thing, kind of describe to someone who might not understand the First Amendment, you know, the ins and outs of it, what would be your sort of way to explain it so everyone would understand the First Amendment exactly? Whenever I was holding that sign on the quad promoting free speech, I said, I don't like it when you call me names, but I will fight to the death for your right to be able to call me that. That being said, threats, slander, libel, those are definitely not covered under the First Amendment. But as long as you aren't directly hurting someone, physically, you know, encouraging physical violence, it's free game. Mm -hmm. And do you feel free in this campus to say what you think? I sometimes will be afraid. I used to be a bit more hesitant my freshman year, but I'm in a lot of classes where my teachers are pretty receptive and I'm able to present my ideas in a fashion that shows that I am willing to have a genuine con conversation. For example, one of my best friends is a socialist and we have some of the best debates ever. <laughs> and then afterwards we just get food and it's fine. And so I think if we could get more relationships like that on campus, it will lead to a better dialogue. Yeah, and I guess the last question that I kind of want to go off of, you mentioning one of your best friends being a, a socialist, is that something that you really wish could happen again? You know, people to have dialogues who have differing opinions, what would be kind of the way to get that restarted again? So I think that we could stop demonizing the other side and stop going to one extreme or the other. Both sides have this issue where they just paint the other side with a big brush. Now I look at my grandparents where my grandfather was a big Bernie Sanders supporter and my grandmother is a big Republican and they have been married for almost 50 years now and that is my inspiration. I think that you should be able to get along with someone else and put politics aside and realize politics is an important part of a relationship but it's not everything. I think that if we could just get that common dialogue and realize we are all human beings, we're not just enemies of each other, fighting against each other, and ev each side wants to improve America, but we just have different ways of doing so. So when everyone is able to kind of realize that, we'll have a much better future. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you. All right, well, something that kind of we found out that is sort of interesting is for the first time ever the United States is actually ranked in the top five deadliest countries for journalists as you can see here this is from uh, Reporters Without Borders they gave this information uh, for 2018 the United States had six media fatalities this past uh, year Afghanistan and Syria up on the top and then uh, they have at least 10 media fatalities 
this is this is company that the United States really does not want to be in, and this is something that's probably really shocked them. Yeah, I was really shocked when I saw this actually, um, and also we had like the biggest story last year was when Khashoggi was killed, mm -hmm. the Saudi Saudi Arabian uh, that works with the Washington Post. So I mean, this is something that is nice to know, and uh, we have to know what solutions we can have uh, to face this problem. Yeah, now we've got three countries in the Middle East, two in North America in that list. We'll see how it's going to look next year. But we're going to take another short break. But when we come back, we will talk about faith and how religion affects college students and campuses today. We'll take a cl close look and hear from another voice after this commercial. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Gregory Hall for this special Hear My Voice production. And while emotional well-being and the First Amendment are divisive issues on college campuses today, nothing seems to spark debate like religion, and that is definitely something that um, I'm very connected to. I'm a Jewish student here on this campus, but there's a lot of other resources for Christian students, Muslim students, uh, Buddhist yes. students, really everyone, but it always seems to spark such a big debate. Yeah, I was going through the list of organizations that we have in this campus, and there's a lot of organizations. Like, I feel that everyone can feel represented uh, whatever your beliefs are so that's really good um, but now yes we have here we have Haley how are you today I'm good thank you for having me today no thank you uh, so uh, do you feel that it's uh, easy for you to be religious in this campus um, well I'm a Jewish student as well and for me religion was a really critical part of my college selection process um, it was a requirement that my parents had that I find a school that had a strong and active Jewish community. And the University of Illinois fit that criteria. Um, the University of Illinois is home to the country's first Hillel, which is the National Center for Jewish Life. And so I felt confident in choosing this university. Um, but that's definitely not to say that it's always easy to be a practicing Jewish student on campus. There's definitely, as um, Ori, you mentioned, a lot of divis divisiveness um, on campus when it comes to religion. And it's not. Um, uh, always the easiest thing to identify as a Jewish student. And I guess something that um, I've always thought about and something that you probably have experience with too is that you grew up in a Jewish household, mm -hmm. very, you know, you're very observant, but obviously when you get into college, it can be tough to stay observant with missing the classes for the high holidays or, you know, having to say like, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that, but also not having access to a synagogue, your parents taking you to do all this stuff. Has that been a challenge for you? That's definitely a challenge and you know one of the great things about coming to campus is you get to learn so much about yourself as an individual and religion is another layer of that and uh, like this university does have in the student code that if you need to miss class for a religious reason that is like an exemption that can be made but that's still a very difficult internal decision to make especially every fall are the Jewish high holidays Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and to have to tell your professors you have to make that decision. Do you want to almost out yourself right from the very start of the school year that you're that student that needs that extra exception to be made for them? And some years I've made that decision and other years I kind of sit back and say, I'll just take these as my, I'm just gonna miss these classes. No explanation needed because I don't want to have that mark on myself right from the very start of the year. Um, so even though there are these things part of the student code to make it easier. It's really down to each student to see for themselves if that's something they even want to follow and participate in. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to someone who is kind of afraid to show their faith in a campus? Well, I've loved being a part of the Jewish community on this campus. I've been very involved, as I said, at the Hillel Center, also in town at the local uh, synagogue, Sinai Temple, teaching Hebrew school and religious school there. And it's been one of the most amazing parts of my college experience to get to have this opportunity. Yes, being away from home and away from parents creates challenges, but it also creates a very unique opportunity to question your religion for yourself and explore different avenues and different ideas and hear from different faith leaders across your religion and across other religions and that is something that can't be mimicked outside of a campus like this. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, grew up with a strong religious background and you're really only within that bubble of your religion, was it kind of, you know, uh, a shock to the system when you're meeting other students, you know, and having interfaith dialogues like that? Did you have experience with that in high school or did that kind of really start in college? It's a really good question, actually, something I've been asked a lot. So before I came to this university, I went to a Jewish day school uh, from preschool through 12th grade. So my graduating senior class was 34 students, and we were all Jewish, and we all knew each other very well. So 
I was not used to being in an education educational setting with people of other faiths. I was, however, very involved in extracurriculars growing up in competitive sports teams and was very exposed to other religions, other races, everything like that. So I wouldn't say that religion became the shock to my system so much as um, the sheer size of the campus. And I think for other students who grew up in small religious communities, a larger issue or obstacle than just interface with other religious perspectives is never having had an experience with such a vast number of people of differing backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Which is also nice, I believe, to, to learn what's out there, right? Yeah, For you? definitely. It's been an incredible experience. And what was sort of like your reaction when you, when you learn about anti-Semitic events that happen in this campus or other campuses? Yeah, well, unfortunately, anti-Semitism is definitely on the rise. And the data indicates it, and I can speak from personal experience. And there's really no worse feeling than waking up to messages either from friends on campus. Um, I know just two years ago, waking up from a message from a friend who happened to be walking across the main quad very early in the morning and was the first to find the swastika that was painted on the undergraduate library and had sent it to me saying like now what what do I do um, and how do you respond to your friend how am I who is also hurting from an experience like this supposed to advise the next group of students facing this and it's particularly difficult when the administration doesn't respond or they respond very infrequently and almost act as if these events aren't hurting. And it's not just the Jewish community. We've had so many other instances on this campus with Muslim students having their hijabs ripped off and the university stays silent. And when you're really looking for that support from someone who's not just your peer, who's not hurting just as much as you, to see that lacking makes the experience even harder. And obviously, sort of the theme of the show, obviously, is you know finding solutions to these issues. You see anti-Semitic attacks, you see anti-Muslim attacks. How do this, how do people sort of get across that bridge and we stop seeing these kinds of things happen? Well, I think the most important thing is to not shy away from the conversation, but to encourage more dialogue on these topics. Something that our administration has said for years is that they want to see more conversations on religious tolerance and tolerance of other sorts, but they're not really happening. Um, and to really create, and to me it seems at this point that it has to stem from students because it's not coming from the top, but for students to reach out to each other and um, I really think we can see the model that's set in the community at times. The uh, Central Illinois Mosque and Sinai Temple have established this really growing relationship over the last number of years of going to each other's events and supporting each other in times of increased hostility and after Pittsburgh and after attacks um, in New Zealand to see these two communities come together and stand with each other in solidarity to mimic that on our campus would be a really great next step to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You are amazing. Thank you so and much. Now, <laughs> let's bring it to discussion to our audience here. Will, Chanel, what do we have? Thank you, Isabella. Well, today we have an audience who's a student, actually. So tell us your name and where you're from. Um, I'm Jennifer Villanueva, and I'm from Chicago. OK, welcome. So tell me, how do you, do you believe that this campus is inclusive to all religions? Um, I think, honestly, we can better improve on how to be more inclusive to all religions. Um, including all races and stuff like that. I feel like the the university should have more of a responsibility to like create these dialogues, like our speaker was saying, about how to create this dialogue and education towards um, becoming more educated through religions and more of an open dialogue on um, celebrations that we have, like religious um, reserve days. I think the university should become more um, aware of those days so that more students are encouraged to like to feel part of this campus through RSOs, through university housing. I think um, me, um, as a multicultural advocate, I would like to encourage more of that connection with um, RSOs on campus and like university housing um, community members so that we can come together and like kind of <coughs> make sure that all, all students are being inclusive and feel that they're, they're welcome at home. Now I know you told me you're a multicultural advocate, so how would you like uh, for like the churches on campus to time to university housing for students? Um, I feel like the best way is that we encourage that everyone on campus that we reach out to each other and we work together as a as a unit to make sure that residents know that these resources are available to them. We, um, as multicultural advocates, hold conversations in residence halls, encourage our residents to come and talk about these social issues that nobody wants to talk about. They're uncomfortable. They're like that kind of point, but we have to make it 
to that point that it's not uncomfortable, but more of an educating point of view. So we encourage that we are welcome to partner up and get more members. Okay, thank you so much. We'll take it back to Isabella at the desk. All right, thank you so much, Chanel. Uh, getting the dialogue really continuing with religion and everything else. Um, but we're going to move on now. We're going to take a quick break. Schools and universities wouldn't exist without teachers who are often not getting the support that they need. What is their budget like and what can be done to help them? That and more after this break. Welcome back to Gregory Hall for this special Hear My Voice production. State of the nation, state of the student, is there justice for all? We're going to change focus from the issues that students at the university face to some issues that um, educators face. So uh, this is something that affects high school and grade school levels. So there is some good news for the university, uh, at least as Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker released his proposed education budget, which includes an increase in spending on higher education. Pritzker plan includes around a 7% increase in spending on higher education and increases on education spending overall. However, public high schools and elementary schools across the state would have to run under a budget of $9 billion. That may seem like a lot of money, but when you consider just how many schools across the state depend on government funding, money would still be tight for many schools. Pritzker team have called this a small step in the right direction for education. They hope that it will be the first of many. Pritzker has said that he has a limited uh, in what he could do with this budget, with the state's multi-billion dollar budget deficit and on payroll bill debt. And we're going to continue uh, looking at the education in the state. Illinois is becoming notorious for coming up short on funding for various programs, including those in schools. So. Are teachers getting what they need to help educate students? Our very own Leah President took this question to educators themselves and to find out some answers. Educators in Illinois work tirelessly to help shape the young minds they teach. Despite the passion for the job, teachers across the state face many difficulties, including the financial. It's part of just like teacher culture that there are just things that you'll dip into your own pocket to pay for. The state is struggling. There, there's not a magic wand. I don't think that there is this magic stockpile of money somewhere that they just aren't <laughs> handing out. I think that the people who do this are doing the best they can with what they have. Even with the financial challenges, there are still young student teachers ready to go into the field later this year. Some are just taking it all in stride. You know, everyone always hears about how like teachers aren't getting paid enough for all their work because you really do work after out. Excuse me, after hours, like. You spend so much time after school planning and preparing and taking, I've already spent money of my own like to buy things for my students that like candy just to reward them for like doing something in class. And then there's the cost of supplies. So we're here at Walmart to add up just how much money it costs to be a teacher in Illinois in 2019. Just having like the supplies that I need, like scissors and, or markers or pencils. My kids are always asking for pencils. You know, some kids just don't have the supplies at home to bring to school. We used a list given by a teacher who has been teaching for close to 30 years. That's close to $850 on a teacher's salary for one year. And this was just for the essentials. A hefty price to pay and demand. For Hear My Voice, I'm Leah President. That number is just crazy. And now we want to know what our audience here tonight thinks about student debt and education. So once again, we're going to send it over to Will and Chanel. Will, Chanel? Yeah. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, one way to deal with all of these issues we have discussed tonight is to be a little bit more creative. Yeah, and we're going to take a look at uh, what our very own reporter Tim Griffin, he took a trip down to the Boneyard Arts Festival a couple of weeks ago where he learned how art can tell different stories. Annually, every spring, the Boneyard Arts Festival comes to Champaign-Urbana and surrounding towns. The festival is a four-day event that showcases a broad range of all sorts of creative activity. One of the venues hosting was the Artist Alley at the McKinley Foundation in Champaign. This one was in reaction to the Michael Brown murder. Paula Hancock, an organizer for the event, 
discuss the art on display and what it involved. We take, it's not necessarily professional. We, uh, we welcome applications from community artists, student artists. We've sometimes done a one-person show, two-person show. This one was a public call for artists around our social justice theme, and we have five artists participating in this particular exhibit. Visitors could fill out posters for what they wanted social justice for. And after, could place their poster on a wall amongst the others. Line it up right here. Next to that. This is the fourth time you're doing Another Boneyard Festival location was Cafe Paradiso in Urbana. The cafe had pieces of art placed all throughout the room and on the walls. The artistic works are eco friendly as well as being made by community members and kids. Boneyard Arts Festival has a variety of locations across Champaign-Urbana, including Cafe Paradiso, where you can enjoy a cup of coffee and some art. After that cup of coffee, art enthusiasts could walk a couple blocks over to the Native American house, where artist Ryan Young had his work on display. We kind of just focused on um, contemporary art and just showing that um, kind of just newer modern mediums and things that uh, Native artists are working with to kind of get past the whole stuck in history part of identity that a lot of people kind of associate Native Americans with. After checking out social justice themed art, grabbing a cup of coffee at an art filled cafe, and learning more about Native American history at the Native American House, Boneyard Art participants could still check out over 90 more venues. In Urbana, for Hear My Voice, I'm Tim Griffin. In Urbana, for Hear My Voice, I'm Tim Griffin. We got a great package team, social injustices and art. So interesting. Thank you for that. And going back to student loans, we aren't the only ones thinking about this this week. Democratic presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren proposed a plan to relieve student loan debts and reduce college tuition. Yeah, Warren announced her intentions to make all public universities tuitions free and forgive student loan debts. Her proposal would relieve an estimated around $640 billion that students currently owe. Warren's plan would forgive all loan debts under $50,000, but it has drawn criticism from many angles. The Washington Post recently released an op-ed that argues that the plan would put too much of a burden on the lower class, but obviously the student loan issue is going to be very active when the 2020 presidential election comes up this uh, next fall. That's right, Ori. And once again, we want to go to our audience there to talk about this, about student debts. So, Will, what are you got there? Hey, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, I have Angela Kernel here with me from the Chicagoland area. So, Angela, uh, we have a lot of stories coming at you right here, uh, right now. And let's start about with the uh, teacher salaries. So, how do you feel about uh, teacher salaries in general and, like, uh, like, what do you feel about that situation? Uh, yeah, I actually got to talk to one of the superintendents from overall school districts in Champaign and Ford counties. I um, mean, she did say that the, there, there is like a, sh a shortage of teachers um, in Illinois and the, the problem is getting worse. And especially, I mean, she talked to me about what the issues were like in Champaign, but related to the story that our reporter here uh, reported on was that we did have um, a middle school teacher, she's student teaching right now, and she's going to work uh, full time after that. So what Jane Quinlan told me was uh, something that they're doing really great in the community is, or not in the community, in their school district, sorry, is that they're trying to get student teachers to get full time jobs afterwards and that will help with retention rates. And then, yeah, that's something that's helpful, I guess, in curbing the yeah, shortages in Illinois. But. Switching over to student loan debt, do you feel that there's something or anything that the university can do and help to alleviate that problem? <laughs> no. I, I don't really, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, That's they, okay. They probably should lower the prices, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we'll go back to you over you, Ori and Isabella. Thank you, guys. I, I don't Thank think Angela so said it better herself. Just lower the prices. Just lower the prices. That's what they say. We're almost at the end of the show, and we're ready to talk about the future of our nation. We have more, and we're going to wrap it up after this final break. Stay tuned for the end of it. Overall in life, I would love to be a writer in some capacity. I've always I've been in love with writing since I was very like young. Um, right now I want to do like TV writing or like screenplay writing. I think that'd be really like a great career for me. I get to perform at Craner, and that is a dream that I've had since I was 11 years old, is just getting on stage at Craner and having people lining up in the lobby to see me and the play that I put on, and that's, that's really an exciting thing. 
Welcome back to this year, my voice production, a state of the nation, state of the student. Is there justice for all? I'm Ori Benatar. And I am Isabella Perez. We're almost reached the end of our show, Ori. So why don't we take a minute to look back at what we've seen? Yeah, I think overall we had some great insight from everybody. Obviously, we started with the ongoing investigation into Professor Joe Petrie, and it's unfortunate that we're seeing a lot of these things sort of come up on college campuses with teacher scandals and things like yes. that. It's happened before at this university, but obviously, check out Wilmo's story again uh, if you have not seen it or missed the beginning of the show. We'll let you know all that info later on. But obviously, um, that mental health issues, of course, I think for me that is one of the most pressing issues on college campuses because of the amount of stress put on school and you know getting your life together it's sort of the first time you're independent and I thought uh, Dr. Weathersby and Alejandro had a lot of interesting things to say about that. Yeah we're glad we have this platform to speak about these things and so people that n can know where to go and reach for help. Uh, I think that the the report about the Petrie story was really interesting and we are, have to see what will happen next with these stories, a developing story. So we'll see what happens. And also the education blog mm -hmm. was really interesting. Uh, what Warren is doing is related to the 2020 presidential elections. Maybe this is sort of a, a strategy to get more votes. We'll see. I think the thing that stuck out to me for the education was uh, the amount of money that some teachers yes. have to spend on supplies. I mean, getting binders and, and books and pencils and everything like that. I mean, And you never think about that. You never think right. what they have to take out of their own pocket right. to serve the students. And but especially in a lower school classroom. You know, I still remember as a kid, you know, you get your, your school supply list. It says you got to buy markers, you got to buy crayons, you got to buy colored pencils. And sometimes, you know, the students aren't able to get even those kind of things. You even Yeah, <laughs> we saw Leah grab some there in her story. But, you know, the numbers are huge when when it comes to education, but in terms of divisive issues that have been happening around college campuses, I mean, religion and freedom of speech, really, really uh, big issues that have been uh, coming up even more so than they had previously. Yeah, and our guests were amazing. They were really nice and they provided a lot of information about their experiences. So it's nice to, to learn from that and we can move on and be better. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's really the big takeaway with this is that we're discussing these things. We're putting it out there, but, you know, talking about it in a civilized way and really realizing what the, some of the issues are and some of the things that, you know, finding a solution to it. Like sometimes you just have something that's that's bugging you or the problems that have been going on in your life or whatever. You know, sometimes just finding that solution. It can be tough in some situations, especially with mental health, but it's just something that's very, very important. You know, it's taking that extra step, finding those solutions. That's why important we started the conversation. Of course. But uh, we do know, though, that we will have a better state of the nation and a better state of the student tomorrow, Isabella. Yes, kids still have dreams. And I went to one special place to find out about the future of this nation. Let's check it out. I'm planning to go to the U of I. Um, Right now, I'm in me engineering, uh, so I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to stay at the U of I, and I'm going to double major in psych and theater. I want to work with kids. I don't know if I can do 8 to 3 Monday through Friday, because sometimes that can be really draining, especially with children. I just kind of want to explore the world of business. I'm not exactly sure what I want to go into, but it's a super cool field with lots of opportunities, so I'm excited for that. Next year, I'm actually going to Denmark, which is where my family is from, to study Danish, because I've always wanted to get back in touch with like, the culture. I was born and raised here, and I know the community here, and I'm really, you know, especially in my mosque, I'm really close with my mosque community, and I really feel like the campus that you have is really nice, and, you know, I know it, so it's not like I'm stepping out of my comfort zone, and for me, I don't think I'm ready to leave yet. I'm incredibly excited because as a theater, uh, an acting major, I get to perform at Craner, and that is a dream that I've had since I was 11 years old, is just getting on stage at Craner and having people lining up in the lobby to see me and the play that I put on, and that's that's really an exciting thing. I just want a non-for-profit that's helping people. And I want it to be standing so that if when I pass, there's something standing that I left behind for the society. I don't want to be like a waste of resources, you know? Probably TV writer uh, for like, like a beloved TV series, like The Office or something. Make the world a better place, as cheesy as that sounds, like just you know, contribute even if it's in a small way, in a small community, or just something small. One of my hopes is, you know, raise a family and have like a, you know, and have kids and kind of receive fulfillment that way, you know, trying to kind of like become a father and stuff like that. And as, and as well as receiving like career success, have success with making new friendships and connections with other people and really enjoying the world that I'm in. 
Great enthusiasm there, Isabella, from the kids there. Yeah, they <laughs> well, were amazing. What was the biggest takeaway from uh, interviewing those kids? Um, there was a lot of diversity, so I was able to speak to a Brazilian girl, two Muslim girls, a girl that was from Denmark. So I like the, the balance. So uh, and they were really nice. High school, all of the co the lockers were open, and they were really excited to start college. Uh, and I was remembering when I was starting college. Right, and now uh, for for both of us, uh, you've got one more year. One more year. I've I've got like two more weeks, but it's it's. <laughs> very exciting to get to that point but we're actually going to take one more break and when we take that after that break we'll have our final final thoughts we're bringing in our senior producer Stephen Cohen and we'll close it out here on Hear My Voice State of the Nation State of the Student is there justice for all. Thank you. Welcome back to Hear My Voice's State of the Nation, State of the Student, Is There Justice for All? I'm Ori Benatar. And I am Isabella Perez. And uh, we're almost towards the end of the line here on the show. And if you had missed anything, any of our great guests, any of our great stories, you can re-watch that. Go to the UI7 news page on YouTube. Uh, there's, uh, of course, the entire show you can watch from beginning to end over again. Uh, if you're curious about anything else that we have worked on throughout the past couple of months, you can check that out as well. And the conversation never ends. Even after the show, use the hashtag Hear My Voice on Twitter. Give us your thoughts about anything regarding education, regarding religion, regarding uh, you know, emotional well-being. And of course on Facebook, at Hear My Voice Online. You can even uh, Instagram, things like that, Snapchat, anything to just get the conversation continuing. It doesn't end after this 90-minute show, but we are actually now going to wrap it up. We're bringing in our <laughs> senior producer. He worked tirelessly behind the scenes over the past few My weeks. My goodness. Happy Passover. Chag Sameach, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on. What do you think? No, this, uh, you know, a lot of difficulties in putting on a live show like this. It's mostly the biggest UI7 production ever. Uh, it's the first ever, I believe, 90-minute show, other than election coverage in the past. Back in November, there were several hours of that, but that was not in the studio. This is a mile away from the studio set up in an auditorium uh, with a live audience, and this was just a wild thing to put, put together. But I think it came out really, really cool, and I think there were a lot of messages to take away tonight as well. What is the the most important thing you take out of this experience? I think mostly that these are actual issues that are pertaining to college students today. And as journalism students especially, it's important that these are the issues that we're covering and we're talking about and we're making sure that it's, it's cliche in that way, but people's voices are being heard because our job as journalists is to give voice to the voiceless. And in this case, uh, we're giving voice to people about emotional health today, uh, about education. Teachers, they don't get heard very much, and they're spending all the money themselves. We're giving a chance for them to be heard. Uh, religion, nobody really talks about religion on con a college campus. It's more of that like, uh, taboo subject that people are afraid to talk about. But I think we talked about a lot of important issues today that I don't know, I just don't see very often on the news. Well, thank you, Stephen, for your hard, hard oh, work. Oh, thank you. You did an no, amazing, amazing job. Amazing. Thank you. Both of you. I don't know. I, th I think you're the real hero of the show, obviously. <laughs> Not at all. all. All 20 of us. Well, thank you again, everyone, for watching, of course. For all the students watching, good luck on finals. Enjoy your summer, and congratulations on graduation. And for Isabella Perez, I'm Ori Benatar. And, of course, in this search for justice, make sure people hear your voice. Thank you. Thank you.